Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, it's really unique what we're doing uh, in the fact that um, you may not be part of our church, but I'm sure that most of the people here are part of our church. We have people from all of our campuses here tonight. Um, it's uh, awesome that we're in this room. It's also unique that it's a Friday night. Um, most people in the world are doing whatever people do on Friday nights, and and we're here in this room because as followers of Christ, we believe that 2,000 years ago, uh, the God of the universe stepped into space and time, and he did the unthinkable. He gave his life for us. And so we worship to that end tonight. And so um, what's going to happen tonight is going to be unique. It's not going to be like a normal church service. We're going to worship. We're going to read scripture. I'm going to say a few words. And then I'm going to lead us in a time of communion with our families. So our families will uh, gather. There will be deacons around the room to help during that time. Um, but I'll, I'll guide you through that process. But uh, we really just want to meet as a family tonight. That's what we're doing. And so uh, what I'd like us to do just as we begin is just to begin as families and to worship King Jesus. And so uh, if you're comfortable, if your family's with you, if you just kind of maybe grab hands right now with your family. And uh, I would like us to pray together. Uh, just pray out loud. The Lord hears our prayers. He can uh, sort them all out. That's the beauty of how magnificent and big God is. And so maybe as you're just holding your wife or your husband or your child's hand or whoever, your friend, just for just a moment and just the silence of this room, just pray out loud. Just say, God, thank you. Thank you for coming. God, we invite you to meet with us tonight. And so would you just do that right now? Just pray as you feel led, and I'll close us in prayer as we continue uh, in song in just a moment. Go ahead and pray. God, we thank you that it is by your grace that we are here tonight. God, it is by your grace and your kindness that we are saved. And Lord, we want to meet with you tonight. All of us in this room have a common issue, and that's that we're all sinners. But all of us, I trust in this room, are sinners who have been saved by your grace and your kindness and your mercy toward us. And so, Lord, I pray that just for a few moments, especially tonight, Lord, that we can remember and reflect on the fact that 2,000 years ago, you gave your life for us, that we may have life, your life for our life. And so, Lord, we don't want to miss this moment. We don't want it to feel like some sort of just religious gathering. Lord, we pray that if there's any sin in our life, Lord, that we would deal with you. God, that we would call on your name. God, you are a God who can forgive no matter how gross our sin may appear to be. God, your grace is more than enough for us. And so, Lord, we pray that we would just cling to you tonight, that we'd rest all of our weight in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Be with us as we sing. As your word is read, Lord, I pray that we would listen and that we would receive it. Lord, as we have opportunity to have communion together, I pray that we would be respectful of all the people in this room and that we would worship in that moment. So God, meet with us. I pray that your spirit would move amongst us. We love you and we long to see your face in the coming kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. How 
deep the fathers of our fathers, how vast beyond all measure that He would give His only Son to make a wretch's treasure. How great the pain of sin the Father turned His face away As wounds which by the chosen Bring many sons to this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who through, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father.
Jesus, you endured my pain. Savior, you bore all my shame. All because of your love. Maker of the universe. Broken for the sins of the Set the captive. 
appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God.
So God, we thank you for this love. We thank you for this redemption. We thank you that through Christ, through the blood that he shed for us, for the, through the sin, our sin that he took upon himself so that we don't have to live for sin, but we could live to righteousness. We thank him. We thank you for the blood. We thank you that we are indeed redeemed. So God, I pray tonight that what you have done for us through the cross of Christ would sink in. I pray that we would be impacted as your word is preached. I pray that, that you would move, Holy Spirit. Let us recognize the price that Jesus paid let us recognize the gift that we have through him. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Two thousand years ago, as Christ gathered um, in the upper room with his disciples on a Thursday night, he did with them what we're about to do as a church family in just a few moments. He painted for them a picture with the elements, the Passover elements that were in front of them, what he had been telling him he would do for the last three years. We know according to John 20, it was at the resurrection that everything began to make sense. All of what scripture had said and all of what Christ had testified to. And it was because of his redeeming love that he was about to endure what he was willing to endure not because anyone was making him do it, but because he was being obedient to the will of the Father unto his death for us. Mark records it this way in Mark chapter 15. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes, the whole council. And they bound Jesus and they led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered them, you have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them a prisoner from whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder, in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and they began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd and to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, then what shall I do with this man that you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion and they clothed him in purple cloak and twisting together 
a crown of thorns, they put it on him. They began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, and they divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription on the charge against him read, King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthia, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, Behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, and they put it on a reed, and they gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw That in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. There were also women looking from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Josie and Salome, whom who was in Galilee, they followed him and they ministered to him, and were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is the day of the Sabbath, Shabbat, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and he went to Pilate and he asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died and he summoned uh, the centurion and he asked him whether he was already dead. And When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph and Joseph brought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in the tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Josie, saw where he was laid. God, we pray tonight for just a few moments as we have the Lord's Supper communion together. God, I pray that we would be so mindful of the fact that you died for us, that it is by your grace alone that you offer us salvation. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. It must have seemed a bit chaotic that night, right? For the disciples who didn't understand fully what was going on until after the resurrection and really not until after Pentecost, the whole night had to be completely out of control and chaotic. They were in the upper room. They had walked with Christ down through the Kidron Valley as he prayed what we see in John 17 and we call the high priestly prayer. Jesus even prayed for unity amongst his disciples. He even prayed for you and I that night 2,000 years ago. But everything that ensued after that was just chaos. It seemed to be at least. Jesus would go and he would pray alone in the garden, Peter, James, and John, his closest disciples and friends couldn't stay awake with him. It was after 500 foot soldiers from the Temple Mount 
And because it was Passover, they were all there to kind of keep away any type of riot that might break out in the temple. They decided that they would come and get this Jewish carpenter, this homeless man from Nazareth, and they would arrest him. Lazarus would lead the charge. He would lead the charge to Christ because for 30 pieces of silver, he would betray one of his closest friends and ultimately we know to be Messiah. All of that took place at 1 a.m. in the morning. This confrontation in the garden lasted for hours, not a confrontation with the Roman soldiers or the centurion, but a confrontation between the Son of God and Satan himself. You see, in the book of Genesis, the Bible says that the serpent was there. The serpent was there to try to destroy God's plans. And God made a promise in what we call the Proto-Evangelium that he would stomp the serpent's head. He would crush him. So you can imagine, perhaps for just a moment, as Jesus was in the garden sweating blood, he was sweating blood because all of my sin and all of your sin was being pressed upon him. He who knew no sin was becoming sin. But not only that, there was a spiritual war going on in the garden. Satan was there mocking the very Son of God. And all of that was typified in an evil friend who for just a little bit of money would betray him. He was arrested, and the Bible says he would face three Jewish trials and then three Gentile trials. He was marched down through the Kidron Valley once again to the southern part of the temple, and by 1.30 in the morning, he is in front of Annas. Annas is not the priest. He is the son-in-law of the former priest. Annas, or I'm sorry, the father-in-law of the, for, or the current priest, and Annas is sitting there, and he is badgering Christ. He's asking him questions, but Christ will not answer him because he has no authority. And so he doesn't know what to do with him, so he throws him in a hole. It's there that Caiaphas would come, the current high priest, and he would been, begin to badger him and ask him questions. And from 3 to 5 o'clock in the morning, we know for sure that he was held in the house of Caiaphas in an old um, uh, water-holding cell in a dungeon underneath, its ho- ho- underneath the house of Caiaphas. He was dropped down by rope, and more than likely, Psalm 88 is speaking of this exact moment when we read it. Jesus is praying to the Father for two hours. He is alone in darkness as the Jewish elites get together to try to figure out some way to have Christ murdered. By 5 o'clock in the morning, the third Jewish trial takes place. All the Jewish elders, including the high priest, the scribes, the Sanhedrin are all together. They decide that the best course of action is to take him to the Roman government because certainly they'll have Christ killed. By 6 o'clock in the morning, Pilate is now awake, and now Jesus will face three Gentile trials. Pilate will hear Christ, but he says, I find no guilt in this man. He declares him innocent, but that's not enough for the Jewish elite. So they take him to Herod Antipas by 7 o'clock in the morning. By 7 o'clock in the morning on Friday, Herod Antipas is badgering and asking Christ questions, but Jesus will answer none of those questions. He has, again, no authority. So Herod Antipas sends him back to Pilate, and it's there that Pilate is confused. He doesn't know what to do. He's already declared him innocent. Pilate thinks to himself, perhaps the key would be to take this murderer and present him to the people and say, you can have the murderer or you can have Christ. Surely they'll want the murderer put to death. But yet, we know what the Bible says. They say in Luke 23, and all of the synoptic gospels give us Barabbas. By 8.30 in the morning, Pilate takes his soldiers, and they take Christ, and they take him to the praetorium or the floor of the flagellation. It's there on the praetorium floor that they mock Christ, and they beat him within an inch of his life. They make a crown of thorns, and they jam it on his head. They ridicule him. They play games for his garments. They mock him. They torture him. He is going to go to the cross. By 9 o'clock in the morning, Jesus is forced to carry his cross outside the city gate. 
It's outside the city gate where Christ would be crucified because this was the law. It would have to be outside the city according to Numbers 5 and Hebrews 4 and 5 where sinners would be crucified, but Christ was not a sinner. By 12 o'clock, we have what we call the momentous three hours of the cross. By 12 o'clock, Christ is hanging on the cross, not on a hill like many of us have seen in pictures, but rather in front of Golgotha, in front of the place of the skull, so that passerbyers, as the Bible said, could curse him and spit on him and throw rocks at him as they would ridicule many of the people that the Romans would crucify. It was there that he would follow and endure the scorn of all of humanity, Everyone, his disciples are gone. Everyone is scorning him, spitting on him, throwing rocks at him, just as the Bible says. But Shabbat is coming. Christ eventually dies. He breathes his last. And the Bible says he's taken down from the cross before Shabbat begins on Friday evening at sundown. And he is put in a borrowed tomb in what we call the garden tomb today. There are three things that we learn from the text that are very important before we come to this table that we need to remember. Everything that happened in the Bible and all four Gospels as we read them of the crucifixion of Christ is exactly what God said would happen. It's shocking to us looking back that the disciples were shocked and it was at the tomb that they began to put the pieces together, but you and I weren't there 2,000 years ago. It would be confusing to us too. It would make any sense that a sinless man would give his own life for sinners, but this is the grace of God. For the disciples, everything seemed out of control. Everything seemed chaotic. It seemed as if Satan and all of his evil minions were winning, but that was not the case at all. As a matter of fact, 750 years before the coming of Christ, the prophet Isaiah had told us exactly what would happen the crucifixion of Christ. In Isaiah 53, verse 1, it says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one in whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquity. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All of we are like sheep who've gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, like a sheep that is before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. It's important that we recognize that what happens in this chaotic moment, the crucifixion of Christ was, in fact, the will of God the Father. Oftentimes, we don't think of that. Oftentimes, because of chaos in our own life, when bad things happen, we believe that perhaps it's because... The evil one is doing things and manipulating things, but that's not the case here. What is happening here is God's perfect will, God's perfect plan is being satisfied. And what you and I need to understand, according to Scripture, is while there even appears to be chaos in the world today, God is sovereignly in control. God is providentially working out all things to fulfill his glorious and salvific purposes. Everything is heading back to Christ. Maybe in your home there is disease or cancer. Maybe there is chaos. Brothers and sisters, listen. 
God will work all things out for his glorious purposes. This is exactly what God said would happen. And God is always right. The second thing that we're reminded of in this text is what happened to Christ had to happen. It's important that we know that. What happened to Christ had to happen. There was no other means in which God could save humanity. You may have heard someone at some point say, God could have saved us in many different ways, but this is the way he chose. But that's not true. That's not even a biblical statement. According to the word of God, the only way in which God could save sinful humanity was through the blood atonement of his son, Jesus Christ. At the very beginning of the story, when sin entered the picture, the very first thing that God does is picture for them, Adam and Eve, substitutionary atonement when he guts an animal and clothes them with its skin. Life for life. Remember, the curse of sin is death. And you and I, because of our sin, we deserve death. And so the only means in which we could be saved is through the death of a perfect one, a spotless lamb. And according to the word of God, over and over and over, the only way that could happen is through the substitutionary atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sinclair Ferguson states, without knowing it, the religious leaders and Pilate and Barabbas were all part of a tapestry of grace which God was weaving for sinners. Their actions spoke louder than their words, louder than the cries of the crowds for Jesus' blood. Jesus was not dying for his own crimes, but for the crimes of others. Not for his own sins, but for the sins of others. He did not die for himself. He died for us. And according to Hebrews 9 through 10, just as it was written, read just a few moments ago, the Bible tells us that blood is necessary for salvation. Blood is necessary, and the only blood that would do is not more bulls and goats and lambs, but rather the blood of the perfect one, the Lord Jesus Christ. God is holy, and God is just, and he must judge sin. His justice is necessary because of his holiness, and the only means in which you and I could be saved is through the murder of Jesus Christ on a cross. His blood must be poured out, and it was. That's the grace of God. The third thing that we know from the text is that the floor of the flagellation, the praetorium, and even the cross actually declare for us the glory of God. If you read the text really slowly, you can actually see the most magnificent picture ever being pointed out. In their mocking, they robe him. They crown him. They identify him as king of the Jews. They bloody him. <laughs> Everything for 39 books in the Old Testament that had been pointing to a true and better king, the Lord Jesus Christ, Israel's Messiah, he would be robed and crowned and ultimately be slaughtered for the people. This is what happens in the moment. While they're doing evil acts, God is glorified. Isn't that amazing? God will get his glory. God is glorified in the death of his son. It doesn't make a lot of earthly sense to us. It didn't make a lot of earthly sense to John. However, John on Patmos is an old man on a rock quarry. When he got a glimpse of heaven in Revelation 5, said, I saw a lamb on the throne as if he had been slain. Everything that happened in this moment brought glory to God. Why? Because one of the greatest means in which God is glorified is when broken, sinful people that deserve death put all of their trust and their weight on the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's like a circle of glory and it all goes to God. Not of works, so that no one can boast, but for the glory of God and his glory alone. Everything appeared to be chaotic, but it wasn't. What was happening in this moment is a victorious death. <laughs> Sounds odd to even say that. 
but it was victorious because it was in his death that death lost, it, death lost its sting. And in this moment, eventually what we'll celebrate on Sunday is a victorious resurrection. And eventually what we'll celebrate as a people is a victorious return. God is victorious. God wins. God's purposes always are satisfied. God will always get the glory. It is through his son that we are saved. It is by his grace and our faith in him alone that we are saved. We must learn to trust in him today. The disciples didn't know what to do. They did the same thing that you and I would have done. We would have scattered, ran, perhaps even pulled out a dagger like Peter and tried to fight off 500 soldiers on our own. But brothers and sisters, we are hopeless apart from the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why when we read this story, we fall more in love with him because he took our place on the cross. Which brings us to a fourth truth in Scripture. And that truth is this, that for 2,000 years, the church has believed this. For 2,000 years, when brothers and sisters have come together, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation have gathered around what we call the Lord's table, and they remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they also remember that because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that one day we will dine in his presence for all of eternity. That's the good news of the gospel, isn't it? That while we live in this sin-sick world and things may appear to be hopeless, because of the death, because of the burial, and because of the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, we will one day see his face. As Tim Keller most famously says, if Jesus really came out of the grave, everything's going to be all right. Brothers and sisters, as we come to this moment with our family, with our friends, whoever you're with, we remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but we are a new covenant people. Jesus Christ is alive and on his throne, and one day he will come back and rescue us because of his satisfying death, his satisfying burial, his satisfying resurrection, one day he will come back and rescue his people. So that's what we're going to do tonight. And that's how we'll be dismissed. So what this place is is a place of worship. For the next few moments, we're going to have the opportunity to gather with our friends and family at tables all over this room. There's deacons spread out. They can help you if you'd like help, or you can just do it by yourself. There's even a paper there to help guide you if you don't know what to do. Scripture in front of you, Matthew 26. And we want to worship. We don't want to talk in this room. We want to worship in this room. If you'd like to talk, then I would ask you to go outside so the people who are in here, as long as they need, can worship with her family together. It's unique how we're doing it because for 2,000 years, this is essentially how the church did it. They would gather in pods as they gathered together and they would exalt the name of Jesus Christ as they would take communion together. So in a very unique way, unlike, well, we, we normally do it, this is how we're going to do it tonight. And so I want to pray for us and I want to ask you in a spirit of worship without any talking to go find a place to worship with your family and friends to have communion together, whether it's two or three or five or six, maybe there's someone that's by themselves and you want to invite them to be part of what you're doing. But we want to do that together, and obviously you can talk around your table to worship together and to pray together. But when you're done, if you would just exit quietly out of the room so people can continue to worship together. Church, I love you so much. And this is one of the most beautiful things that we can possibly do as a body of believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ, is be reminded and remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? It's by his grace that we are saved. God, we love you, and I pray as we gather around tables over the next few moments, I pray that you are exalted. God, that we cling tightly to the reality that it is by your stripes we are healed. And so, Lord, I pray that this place would be a place of worship. God, that we would respect each other's 
time to worship together. God, that we would just lift high the name of Jesus Christ. So God, be with us, meet with us. We love you and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me right now and begin? There's tables up front. There's tables in the back. There's tables in the corner. But we love you in the quiet of this room to just worship together.